My name is Katie Fisk. Um, I'm in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm currently a disaster recovery case manager with uh, Catholic Charities. Um, I've been working on the Colorado floods for almost two years now. So I've been working um, with Colorado floods and long-term recovery. Um, previously before Catholic Charities, um, I was with Red Cross um, and we did a very different, very unique recovery program. We had a group of four people. I oversaw the individual assistance um, portion for uh, for Red Cross. We also had uh, two other of my coworkers. They did more of the community partnerships in specific counties, um, and then we had a, a manager and a supervisor for um, for everyone. So a lot of things I think worked very well for Colorado um, flood recovery that I think have been very different and very innovative um, versus the other um, the other disasters that I've been involved in. Um, just a little bit of context. Um, I've been working in emergency management for about five, six years now. I also have an academic background in it too. So, um, but uh, okay. So the community partnerships that Red Cross did, I think, were were um, really good in the sense that. Um, we went in from a perspective of what is it that the community needs. Really going in and listening first, I think, was really, really vital. Um, How and did then, you go about uh, engaging with the communities? Uh, show up. You got to show up. You got to show up. You need to um, just kind of take that active um, participation, meet, network. Um, like starting with the city councils or with the, within the church groups or community. Just find out, find out um, when meetings are taking place. Finding out who the key people in the community are, I think, is very, very important because you could have, you know, people that are in city council or people that are put in leadership positions, but. You also have other people that take on leadership positions without that official official title, right? Um, so finding those key people, I think, was very important. The other thing that happened here, especially in a, in a few communities, was that you had residents that went door to door and knocked on people's houses. And, you know, they would say, hey, this is what's going on. These are the resources that are available right now. Um, you know, how, how are you doing? How's, you know, are, are you, what are your needs? And, and just having that kind of one-on-one -on -one discussion and dialogue, I think is really, really, really important. Um, but that just kind of spontaneously happened in, in a few communities. Um, that didn't happen all throughout the communities. I think for that, it was very important to have kind of that local person from the community be the one to do that, to go around and knock on door to door and know the people in the community and kind of do that that grassroots um, outreach. And so once we figured out who those leaders that kind of sprung up in these communities were, um, then we could partner with them. Then, you know, because I mean, they needed to know that. They needed to know what organizations were out there, what resources were out there, what was available. Um, so it's kind of these, kind of this grassroots, you know, coming together with these agencies and organizations and then trying to figure out the parameters of each program. Like the marriage, you're just like a real estate agent in a sense, you're putting a buyer with a mm -hmm. house that they love or, or mm -hmm. understanding both sides. And you talked a little bit about academia, um, and how does that translate down to the boots on the ground and from your experience or how should it? That is a good question. Um, uh, I, one of the sessions that we had um, previously, which I think was, was a really good poignant comment that someone from the community made is that you know uh, you know she was working in the floods and she had some you know researchers say hey I want to come and study your communities you know and her first response was well what's in it for me you know if you want to come and study what it is that I do you know like what's my motivation to do that I mean you know because I I may not be giving anything monetary but I'm carving out part of my time to spend you know, and, and discuss this. So, um, yeah, really trying to figure out um, the motivation, but also making sure that um, researchers and academia know how to communicate their research effectively. And what are the ways that it is most effectively being communicated, do you think? 
as of now. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, because I've been on both, I've been on both sides. Um, I have actually read a lot of papers in long-term recovery. I've um, looked at a lot of articles. It's because that's something that I'm interested in doing. Um, does everybody that work in long-term recovery do that? Does everybody in emergency management do that? No, no. Um, there needs to be more of a more of a bridge. Um, in my experience, I will say there's kind of two people that work in emergency management, two kinds of people. Um, I think people that um, know how to respond, right? They're really good at figuring out how to go in, respond, take care of the situation, and then, you know, pull out. Um, but what's left there is that community and um, you know, looking at it from a holistic point of view, and how do we, how do we as a community, how do we create ourselves to be resilient, and um, that I think is really where um, a lot of the research and the academia can come in, um, can come into play. But um, yeah, I mean, it is a whole cycle, right? I mean, it is it is a whole cycle. So, so. what tools do you think that you could use that don't exist right now to do be more effective in the work that you're doing? And maybe the question is more specifically, like um, from FEMA, um, what could they provide you that would enable you to be more effective? Well, I think, at least from my perspective, so um, uh, right now I'm I I'm a case manager. I'm a recovery case manager, and so that I'm kind of that main point of contact between the client and the resources that are that are out there. Um, in other, uh, in other disasters I've worked at, you know, you have the the client that can go to five or six different agencies, tell their story five or six different times, but then kind of get that fatigue, right? Um, so as a case manager, I'm kind of their main their main point of contact, and I know all the all the resources. Um, Sometimes the groundwork and the process for accessing those resources, even as a case manager, and I deal with this all the time, um, there's some bumps. There's some obstacles to it. Um, uh, sometimes not all the pieces are, are put together. Um, so that would be helpful, I think. Um, also, um, Recovery and long-term recovery, it's a totally different animal. It's a very different animal from response. Um, so starting to plan for recovery, right, either, you know, definitely before, but also during the response phase, I think would be incredibly helpful. Um, I mean, speaking from, speaking from the Colorado floods, um, you know, that happened in 2013. Uh, disaster case management, the DCM grant did not come up and running, so they were awarded the grant in, I think, March or April, and didn't get the funding, and then people actually didn't get up and trained until June, July, August, so at that point, we're almost a year. We're almost a year after the disaster, and at that point, you know, people, they just, they just want to get on with their lives, right? You know, they just want to um, have... Well, they already have gotten on with their lives. Or they have. They just want some wait. sense of, they want some sense of normalcy, and they, you know, they just, they just want their lives back. Um, so it, 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 it took quite a while. It took quite a while. So um, at least with, with the Red Cross program, um, I mean, even that, took a while for the recovery program to get up and running, but it filled a very necessary gap. It filled a, it filled a gap between when the response until disaster case management got up and running. Um, it filled a very important gap for people to get at least some kind of assistance. Some and how do you assistance. know when um, recovery is complete to a point where it's time for you to move to another case by I mean, what is that I mean, yeah. it's kind of a lifelong thing in a lot of circumstances so. that that is um that's a really it's great question judgment, right or um it's a really great question it um depends on a couple things it depends on the funding do we have a funding to continue being a case manager 
I think is, is a big key. Um, and is there a need? You know, is there a need? Um, as of now, um, we just got extended until December of this year. Um, it might be possible that the case management that I work on may get extended beyond that. At this point, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it is going to depend. It is going to depend on the need. Um, fortunately, um, uh, I think the need is being considered heavily versus, um, you know, the pot of funding. I think you know if if we can demonstrate that there is a need and that is by collecting data right that's by collecting numbers it's by collecting okay how many open cases do we have how many more people are still impacted um, if we can demonstrate that there's still that need then you know then we, we can continue the work so is that the, the job of the academic the data collecting again I mean does it get back into the the observant scientists looking at this that then you can make your educated decision on their observations? You know, where is it? Um, in my experience, we practitioners are the ones that are collecting the data. And we're collecting the data that is um, required from these various funding sources that we get. So it's, you know, it's there. Um, structure and also the organization that we're with it's their structure for saying we want you to collect this amount of data we want you to collect this amount of data um, after the data is collected and all compiled you know we send that information to our funder um, I don't really think that the academic has their hand in the pot at that point and they're not necessarily communicated, do they have access to the data that is collected in a, in a sense? So it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And um, are there ways that um, you could see integrating these two entities more successfully than, than it has been, which is kind of non-existently? Mm. Without them getting in your way? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, Probably, I think, yeah, probably there there would be a need for that. Um, I think that we would need to know that there's interest mm -hmm. in that. Like, because uh, I think sometimes, you know, and this is just in general, I think people have a tendency just to kind of be siloed in their area, right? Like they, you know, specialize in their area and this is just routine and, you know, this is what they do and and not having that connection I think because um, you in your work you are a conduit between the resource mm -hmm. and right the need right I'm the and it does seem like one of the the biggest goals of this organization is to break down these silos to have these different entities communicating effectively with each other um, like they're a team and we were just speaking to this Australian man and he said the the structure in Australia is basically every team um, is composed of scientists, academic, uh, the community leader, the uh, wilderness or uh, you know emergency responder. So they have all of their groups are not just coming from one of the silos. They are representing each silo, and um, so it, it. But it's a model we don't really have here. Mm. Um, with all the various disciplines, yeah, um, uh, I think now there are more organizations that are grouping together, that are coming together, um, especially if you've got, you know, groups like the VOADs and the long-term recovery groups, and that's kind of the, uh, community-based, non-profit, local government agencies that are coming together, um, but I think, yeah, there's definitely room for that interdisciplinary, you know, academic world to, to come in. Um, so in the past, you know, in the past couple years, um, let's see, this is 
probably my second interview, I would say, but it's not really specific for the floods. The first one I did have an interview for, it was an academic researcher that was working on his dissertation. Um, and I, I will also say this, um, uh, you know, I, I took about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, just kind of talking with him about, you know, what I did and the projects that I worked on. Um, but I have not received any follow-up from that. Um, so I think that that is also really important that, you know, if, if, um, to open that up and be willing to discuss that. that right, like what is the data? What is the result? Of right, what is the data? result? So, you know, I spent, I spent time with you in this, you know, kind of relationship that, you know, then you would share the information back with me and that, you know, that, that hasn't happened yet. So, well, hopefully it will on this point. so it's, important, yes, you know, to follow important. through it's with really that. Important. So, well, it's also that, that, um, uh, closing a loop, mm -hmm. you know, to where then he has basically someone who he can come to and you know you can say, hey, by the way, this is something you might be interested in, but if, if there isn't feedback in both directions. Right, and you know, I, don't, I don't know. But often with the academics, you know, they're basically just like, you, you are data he was collecting, mm -hmm. in a sense. So can you talk a little bit about um, some of the obstacles in your work and um, what resources you could use to overcome some of the obstacles? Um, I think one of the largest obstacles is the amount of time that resources take to get up and running. Um, I mean, right now we're, we're working with a state grant, Community Development Block Grant for Disaster Recovery, Alphabet Soup, CDBG, DR. Um, we're also working with the Hazard Mitigation Buyout Program, 404 Buyout Program for FEMA. Those programs take a very long time, a very long time. Um, so you've got you've got two things going on, right? So you've got the programs that take a while for their process to get up and running, um, but then on the client end, you also have stuff going on with them. I mean, every case is different. Everybody's situation is different. Um, you know, it's it's not just that this disaster impacted them. They also have their life going on, too. So it's, you know, all these other factors that can kind of come into play. Um, so, granted, I think on the client end, I think that's always going to happen. I would like to see things move a little bit more quickly as far as the um, resources, especially the government resources that um, that take a while to process. And how do you as a caseworker um, legitimize, in a sense, the need of the client to be true? You know, do you have to do any background or ask them for any sort of proof <laughs> or, of what they're claiming? And Absolutely. Um, we do have to vet them. Um, we, we do need to make sure that they're damage um, or that they were impacted by the 2013 floods. And if we have that connection um, and there is a need, then we can go ahead and, and move forward and, and we can help them. Um, yeah, I mean, I've run across some people that, you know, don't have that, but, um, but you know. But in general, most people that, that you're in touch with, you know, there's plenty of true need out there. Yeah. And yeah. people that, yeah. yeah. Well, and I think I think the clients are going to be twofold. One of them are um, people that know about social services and know how to ride that social services horse, and then other people that have never experienced working with social services at all, no idea, and that you know sometimes those folks are usually the ones that have a really hard time asking for help, um, like especially with the the. Um, the mountain communities that we that we deal with, I mean, they're they're very proud of the fact that they're self-sufficient. You know, they're up in the mountains, they're doing their own thing. You know, they're a self-sustaining community. Um, but to ask for help, I think, is very outside of their comfort zone. So each case is different. I mean, to kind of get back to your question, so each case is different, and so they need to be weighed very differently. So. Um, it's a very certain kind of skill set to do case management. Um, uh, and what would you say that skill set is? 
So you need to be able to balance being very empathetic and listen to the client, but still be able to guide them um, to focus on their disaster related needs and um, to, you know, help them through their recovery and to be realistic with them and to be I'm realistic sure. and to set expectations and manage your expectations well I think is very important so um, this has really been a learning process I think for all of Colorado um, because uh, we do have kind of a mixture of both, right? Like we've got some people that have worked in um, disaster recovery before and then some people that this is like brand new. They might have been, um, you know, social service workers before and now they're doing disaster case management, which is, you know, maybe a little bit outside of their realm, but um, it has it has kind of been a, a learning process for everyone involved. So um, the other thing I, I would would like to mention is that so after we've gone through this, right, I mean, it's been almost two years, um, we have a certain kind of knowledge skill set that we've gained because of this experience. So um, I think as a state, just because we've gone through that, we're much better prepared, I think, for the next round. But I would also like to, um, if possible, you know, be able to share what we've learned with other, with other locations that, you know, maybe going through the same same situation or, um, you know, just to kind of share lessons learned, I think would be very beneficial. I think that's one beneficial. of the objectives of this association is to not have these incidents be isolated where there, where there's collective knowledge and there's access to this collective knowledge. So it isn't like reinventing the wheel every single time mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. ensure there are circumstances that are going to be different mm -hmm, so sure. everything won't fit. Right, right, right. But right. to start from scratch, it is, seems like, you know, when there's so much expertise that's been on the ground and so many lessons learned and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure even you starting, if you were starting day one again from where you are now, you would be already... Oh, yeah it would be a different template. It would be, it yeah. would be. Yeah, and that's the thing too, is that every every disaster is gonna be different. Every, um, you know, skill and lesson learned might just be very localized for that area, right? Um, uh, but I think that there are some kind of main themes that, you know, can be shared and, you know, kind of that cross, um, cross knowledge, I think would be, would be really good to, to have. Um, also, I think that people that are going through a disaster or have been through a disaster, that's kind of that low-hanging fruit, that they get it, you know, that they understand how important it is versus an individual or a community that has never experienced that before. Like, well, why, well, why should we pay Colorado, attention to it? I think the flood came out of left field. We're used to fires, right? We're yeah. used to fires, we're used to snowstorms. Not, maybe. Maybe. Maybe turn it, right? But no, a hundred, five hundred thousand year flood? No, we're not used to that. No, no, insane like, we're not the amount of that. destruction I mean, and the and it, would you say most of the communities at this point two years later um, the infrastructure is in place and they're up and running or what percentage of wholesomeness have they achieved um, the flood has changed Colorado yeah. the flood has changed the communities of Colorado um, for good and for bad. I think um, there were a lot of communities that strengthened and bonded together and started talking and having discussions with each other that had never met before. Um, so I think there are stronger communities because of it. Um, I also think that sometimes, you know, people couldn't stay there or they didn't want to stay there anymore, so they left. You know, you have kind of that. Um, diaspora of, of, you know, leaving. Um, so the community is, is never going to be the same, you know. Um, so yeah, do you feel that not. this is your life work? Is this what you're here for, to help people in need and yeah. be that kind of, well, it's about as beautiful a work as you could do, and it's got to be yeah. tremendously satisfying and also frustrating. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's a yeah. That's a good way to encap. Yeah, it's um, it is very rewarding. It is very gratifying. Um, it can be very frustrating, and um, 
you know, you you probably know some clients really are difficult, creative but and resourceful yourself on where the low hanging fruit resource wise is. Mm-hmm. You got to think outside the box. Do you, have you to. feel you have a team of people that are your peers or are you in a sense isolated as a caseworker in the work you do? No, I think, um, uh, I made some really good connections with other case managers, with other people that have worked in Colorado flooding. Um, but I mean, it's like any organization, right? You've got really great people that are passionate about what they do. And then some people are, you're like, why are you here? But there, I will say that those people are kind of very few and far between and, you know, they're not here it's anymore. It's probably also so. because the nature of the work, if you weren't an empathetic person, you wouldn't be in this You world. wouldn't, no. I don't, it's, it's, case management is a very specific mm-hmm. skill set. It takes a very specific kind of person to, to do this work. So you gotta be patient, you gotta yeah. be empathetic, you gotta be very creative. Um, yeah, you you want to have that desire to really help people, um, and that that's really what I love about it. Um,